Well, good morning and welcome to the morning show here at Faith Church. If we haven't met before, my name is David Carter. And I'm Bernie Reno. And um, Bernie, you were right. Yeah, well, you know, you contacted me uh, about the eclipse. You're going into Ohio. Uh -huh. I said, you know, it's going to turn out better. There was a front coming through and the front came through. Now, good news for you. Awful news for us here it's, in Belfort and State College. I mean, it was I mean, it, it was dead cloudy. You couldn't see anything. The only thing you did see around 315, it got as dark as evening here yeah. all the lights so you knew something it was it was mm -hmm. eerie mm -hmm. it was very eerie but certainly nothing like what you saw everybody that told me that they saw the eclipse said it was just they can't even explain it you, you really can't i mean like there was i i sat there for the full and we were in a pretty central spot in totality mm -hmm. so we had the maximum amount of time which is which was so about four great. minutes yeah yeah however long it was yeah. it felt like it felt like the eternity and yet no time at all mm -hmm. but like i was just we were staring at it and i was just screaming yeah my wife I, got a video of me going just Whoa! and then when totality I, I, when it turned dark that it just seemed i just it, i just understand it just feels very still very different the temperature drops the temperature dropped drops by it well. felt like 10 to 15 degrees to be it honest was several with you. degrees no doubt about that but i will say people said so i did a couple things i looked up at the sky i saw a couple of stars or planets yeah. which was just breathtaking but more importantly um, people people said was they were like oh yeah like the animals are all going to be quiet yeah. you know blah 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 the problem is i was sitting in my hammock couldn't hear anything, huh? And there were fireworks going off behind us. Like people were just setting off fireworks because it was so dark. It, um, I took a picture of, um, of it was full sun, uh -huh. 78 degrees. It was yeah. so hot. It was a beautiful day. And then it went to like 8 p.m. Yeah. And then it came back up again. It was just like, but just that, just that little sliver up. I mean, you think about how much heat comes off the sun, and mm. just that little sliver. Once the sun peaked behind the moon. You couldn't look at it anymore, right? And it was warm again. It was bright again everywhere, and it was just gone like that. It's just amazing, also, how we've been able to predict these since the dawning of time. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 it's incredible um, that this has been going on forever. I, I wish that we could see it here, but as I said, mm -hmm. your gain, our loss. So I will say, well, we gotta wrap this up here, but um, I will say that um, somebody I saw a joke on Facebook that said. Imagine somebody who doesn't have television or internet or anything, and they were outside that day. They yeah, like, they're wondering. What is happening? <laughs> it's just nighttime all yeah. of a sudden. Yeah. Can you imagine not knowing? Like uh, back, imagine in days, back in those days. Back in those days, it was probably a, a Sorry, sign man. of bad things. Yeah. I would hey, we're gonna get started in just a minute. We're so glad that you're yep. here. Be present with us. Be present with God. Give Him praise and glory wherever you're sitting, because He deserves it for so many reasons. We're gonna get started in just a minute.
of Faith Church. We'd love to help you um, find community and find belonging and find purpose at the church. And one of the ways that we can best help you do that is if you fill out the New Here card that you can find in the pew right in front of you. It's also found at belfonfaith.com slash bulletin. If you fill that out and drop it off in the offering box on your way out today, we'll reach out to just start a conversation and, uh, and help you find your place here at Faith Church because we know that that can be sometimes a difficult process uh, to get to become one of a new group of people. Um, a couple of other announcements that we wanted to share with you. Um, next weekend, there's a couple of opportunities we wanted to bring to your attention. Um, the first one is that during worship next weekend on Sunday, we will be celebrating confirmation of several students at both services. And so that we hope that you're able to be here and celebrate um, students confirming their faith in Jesus Christ um, with us next Sunday at both services. And we also wanted to let you know that between services and hopefully after the second service, the prayer quilt ministry, who does a lot of good work uh, for, uh, giving quilts and blankets away to people who are um, celebrating something in life or going through something difficult. They'll be selling some items in the lobby next weekend, and so if you want to be, if you want to come prepared for that, you can come prepared for that as well. The weekend after, the last weekend in April um, of the 27th and the 28th, on the 27th Saturday, we have a blood drive down in the fellowship hall. And on the 28th, we have uh, two opportunities to um, support our youth who are going to Costa Rica on an international mission trip. Um, in the morning, we'll have some uh, bake sale. All the funds will go to their trip to uh, Costa Rica. And in the afternoon, we're going to have a paint and praise night, um, which is basically an a, um, instructor-led painting evening, afternoon. It's at 2 o'clock, um, and as, again, it's all the proceeds from that are going to go to the youth trip to Costa Rica. It's just also just a fun time to connect with other people in the church. You can bring your kids. Um, it's, I think it's pretty use, um, beginner-friendly. So if you're like, I don't paint, like, well, maybe now's your time because some rooms around your house might need painted and now you'll have an opportunity to develop your painting skills. I don't know if, I don't know if the skills uh, you know, cross-pollinate from one to the other or not. But anyway, so you can sign up for the paint and praise out in the lobby or you can sign up online. All right, well, hey, all that information and a lot more uh, is available and uh, for you in the bulletin, so be sure to check that out uh, before you leave or sometime today and find out how you'll get connected and plugged into the life of the church in the coming weeks and months. All right, well, today we have a great opportunity to give our God thanks and praise, and so as we enter into worship, let's stand together and sing. Jesus, you are the only king 
facing, we can raise a hallelujah, we can give you thanks, we can give you praise. And God, we realize that sometimes raising a hallelujah, giving you praise, singing songs with everything that we have doesn't mean we're giving everything we would want to give. Sometimes that means all we have to give is 25%, but God, we're going to give you every single percent of that. Every single percent that we have that we can give to you today and every day, God, we want to give that to you. And Lord, we're thankful that your grace and your mercy makes up the difference. It's never been dependent upon us. It's never been dependent upon us to give you enough praise or enough glory. But God, you are the one who fills the gap through your son, Jesus Christ. But God, whatever we're facing today, the stuff that we're facing, help us remember and help us to know that, that it is through continuing to, to give you thanks and continuing to praise you. And, and, and doing that in, in, in as loud as we metaphorically can in our lives, that's one of the ways that we'll experience your grace. That's one of the ways that we'll experience your mercy. And God, we're thankful that in the midst of whatever we're facing, that maybe wants to steal our joy. We're thankful that our praise of you and giving you whatever we've got to give is a testimony of your love. It's a testimony of your work in our lives. And we're thankful that even in that place, your presence and our praise of you is a witness to who you are and your presence in our lives. And so God, we, we lift you today we, we magnify your name in this place. We give you praise. We give you thanksgiving because of who you are, even if it's hard to see it right now. And we pray the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. All right, well, hey, as you guys are having a seat, we want to invite the kids who are going to Children's Church. You guys can come down front and meet Miss Bethany, who's going to be walking you back to your classes. Um, and we also want to remind you, um, if there's anything in life that we can be um, encouraging you with in prayer, um, something you're celebrating or something that's not going very well for you, we'd love to be able to um, lift those things in prayer to God. And one of the ways that you can let us know that is by filling out the prayer card that's in front of you in the pew. It's also available online. If you fill that out, drop it in the offering box on your way out. The prayer team will be lifting you in prayer this week. 
Let me also uh, welcome you this morning. We are uh, so glad that you are worshiping with us. Uh, my name is Andy Morgan, one of the pastors here, and um, we are uh, grateful for your presence. Um, it really is a joy to come together. We're in a, a series talking about joy. Um, if you weren't with us last week, we just started last week, and um, we are looking at the letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the people um, in the church of Philippi. Um, Paul was a kind of a missionary uh, went on missionary journeys. He started churches and he communicated with those churches through these letters. And uh, if you weren't with us last week, Paul was sitting in prison when he wrote this letter. Um, he didn't know the outcome of what he was facing. He didn't know um, there was a trial coming. He didn't know if he was going to be flogged and beaten again. He didn't know if he was going to be executed. He didn't know if he was going to be set free. So there's great uncertainty. But Paul talks about joy. Um, in this letter, he talks about it a lot. He talks about his own joy. He talks about how to experience joy. And even in the midst of his adversity, he's talking about joy. And one of the things we heard last week is that uh, what brought joy to Paul was this relationship he had with the church. Uh, the people in the church in Philippi uh, just loved Paul so much that they sent a gift. They sent one of their leaders, a, a man named Epaphroditus, um, who became a, a partner with Paul in ministry, and they worked hard together. And Paul was so grateful for their relationship. That relationship brought him joy. And so we talked about the need um, in our own lives for relationships that bring joy. And maybe we need to work at building relationships with other people to bring that joy. This past Monday... There were a lot of opportunities to build relationships that hopefully brought joy as kind of particularly in this region of our country, we all um, talked about or experienced uh, the solar eclipse. Now, it was not very exciting in this area. Um, it was kind of cloudy and I was sitting there thinking, is it now? Is it now? Like I forgot what time it was and I'm like, it's not dark. And then it got a little dark, like it was going to rain. And I was like, oh, maybe this is it. So it wasn't all that exciting here, but it was a shared experience. Everyone was talking about it. Everyone was talking about where they had gone to see it. Or I was talking to a man this morning, went up to some place in New York. He traveled there to see it. And I said, how was it? He goes, it was cloudy. And I was like, yeah, unfortunately for a lot of people, you know, you make all these plans and you go... And so we talked about some of the disappointments. I listened on, uh, or I watched on TV, watching the places of, you know, totality and the people that were there and the, the shared experience of the people. And it just gave us something to talk about, which was the amazing way our world is put together. I mean, it still boggles my mind that the sun is the exact distance away. The moon is the exact size that it is the exact distance that it is that when it passes in front of the sun, it completely blocks it out. Well, I shouldn't say completely. It blocks it out so we can see that tiny little ring around the outside. That little ring that shows us, you know, the little solar flares that we can learn so much from. I mean, it just amazes me that the world was put together so perfectly. It gave us something as a, as a, society as a nation to gather around in a, in a positive way. Our common experience enabled us to, to feel some joy. I heard one commentator talk about how for at least one day, we're not talking about all the things that divide us, but we're talking about something that unites us, this amazing world we live in, this amazing event that we're, that we're seeing, but it's something that unites us. And that leads to another aspect of what brings joy, and that is unity. The Apostle Paul is the one who says, look, your unity can bring joy. So we're in Philippians chapter 2, just the first two verses says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit, being one in mind. Your unity coming together brings me joy. If it brings Paul joy, then we have to, we have to understand that unity is going to bring the church in Philippi joy. So unity brings us joy. 
And so if there's joy in unity, one of the things that robs us of joy is conflict and division. I have shared many times in my 16 years here that we have not experienced as a church great conflict. One of the joys of this congregation for me is that we have a variety of opinions on a lot of things. We, we have different views in so many different ways, but somehow we are able to come together in Christ Jesus. We have something that, that we know connects us, and that is a love of God. It is a love of Christ Jesus. It's understanding who he is and who we are. And that unity has brought me and I, I trust that it's brought all of us joy. We have different views, but we have been of one heart and one mind when it comes to our faith. We've been able to do what the world around us has not been able to do. We are a divided nation, and we are experiencing great conflict. As we head into another general election, which I know none of us really like, (laughs) the divisions that we are going to see are going to become even greater. And I'm not just talking about the division between, say, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. Yeah, there's a, there's a division there. But some of the divisions that are tearing us apart right now are actually divisions within the parties. We, we see it all the time, or we see it a lot more now. There are those in the Republican Party that say it's moved too far to the right, and there are other, others that say, no, 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 it's too middle of the road. And those divisions is creating conflict. There are those in the Democratic Party that says that the party is moving too far to the left. And then they're saying, no, 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 the party needs to be more middle of the road. And so there is division on the Democratic side that is creating great conflict. So we have division between the parties. Then we have division within the parties. And let's just add the other parties that are out there that might be trying to promote their own views, their own way. And we realize that we are divided. There is great division. One of the common themes that we are going to be hearing for the next several months, both sides of the political aisle are saying this about their opponents. Both of them are saying, the other side is destroying democracy. Both sides are saying that. They're they're looking at different things, but both sides are saying it is the other side that is destroying democracy. I heard the author and pastor Adam Hamilton say this. What will destroy democracy is not Trump or Biden, but our inability to offer one another grace, understanding, and love. Without those things we will tear each other apart. If we're going to hold together, we have to find ways to offer understanding and grace and love to one another. When we don't, we, we kind of demonize the other side, we destroy the other side, and in the process, we destroy ourselves. You know, last week we learned that joy comes with relationship, and it does. When, when God created the world, there was just one man. And God looked at Adam and said, this is not good. He needs a, a partner, a helpmate. He, he needs another person to experience the fullness of life and joy. And so he created Eve. And we had two people. And we had conflict. Because Adam blamed Eve for sin, which I'm sure did not go over well with Eve. And then Eve blamed the serpent, and we had conflict. And then everything was fine when Adam and Eve had one child. But as soon as there was Cain and Abel, what did we have? Jealousy, division, conflict. 
you know, the Bible says that where two or more are gathered, Jesus is there. Sometimes Jesus is there to be the referee. Because anytime you have two people together, there's going to be conflict. Which means that if we're going to experience joy in relationship, we have to learn how to deal with conflict in loving, gracious, Christ-like ways. Paul had to tell the church in Philippi to be of one mind because they weren't of one mind. That's why he's writing the letter. There was some conflict. There was some theological conflict in the early church. One of those conflicts was the, di the division they saw between, say, a Gentile Christian, someone who is not uh, a Jew who becomes a follower of Jesus, and the Jewish Christians who accepted that Jesus was the Messiah. Many of the Jewish Christians, not all, but many of them were saying, you have to be Jewish to really be a follower of Jesus, which means you have to follow the 616 Jewish laws like circumcision and only eating certain foods and a procedure in hand washing. And so there were a group of Christians who said, you got to follow the law. But then there were other believers, many of the Gentile believers who said, no, 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 there is freedom in Christ Jesus. We are set free from the law. What the law couldn't do, God did through Christ. We're not bound by the law anymore, so we can do whatever we want to do. Well, there was conflict. There was division. What does it really mean to follow Jesus? And so there was a theological division that the early church faced, and they faced it in Philippi. There was also some personal division in the church in Philippi. We don't know exactly what it was, but there was some personal conflict. In Philippians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul says, I plead with Euodia, and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. yes. And I ask you, my true companion, help these women, since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. There are these two women. We don't know what the conflict is. But, but they're kind of at each other. And Paul says, help them be of one mind. Bring them together. What I love is that Paul does not say, one woman is right and the other is wrong. Just follow the right woman. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't celebrate one and demonize the other. I'm sure whatever their issue is, Paul could have taken a side. Paul often took sides in all kinds of things, but he didn't. He said, just help them get together because they both have been faithful. They've both contended at my side. They've both worked with me. They both have value. They both have faith. We got to work together. And so he, he's passionate in calling them to come together despite their differences. You see, if we can be united, if we can come together as one, even with the different views that we hold, we will experience joy. And, and the way to live together in unity in our relationships, even when we have differences of opinions, is found in what Paul says in his letter. So we go back to Philippians chapter 2. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. It's love that enables us to come together as one. It's the love of God that enters into our lives that then enables us to love one another despite all the different views that we might have so that we can remain united, one body in Christ. And love is possible 
Because the kind of love we're talking about is not a, oh, I really like you, I have warm, fuzzy feelings for you, you know, affection. We're not talking about that kind of love. Here we're talking about a rugged determination to stay together. Honestly, sometimes that's love. If you're in a marriage, sometimes the love is that rugged determination that we're staying together. <laughs> May not feel like it, but we're going to do it. Love sometimes is that we are going to be united and we're going to work for that and we're going to understand one another and offer grace and compassion and mercy to one another so that we can remain together. Now, Paul tells us what this love looks like. In one of his other letters to a church, the church in Corinth, Paul writes about love. It's a very famous chapter. It's called the love chapter and it's often read at weddings. It'll sound very familiar. Here's what I would like to ask you to think about. What is the love that Paul talks about here in 1 Corinthians 13? What does that love look like socially, politically, in our divided nation, in the conflict we have because we have different opinions and different views? What does it mean for us to love one another this way? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning at verse 4 says, love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable. It keeps no record of wrongs. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. What does that love look like in our divided world? See, Paul isn't calling us to just have this kind of love in marriage. I think he's calling us to have this kind of love in the church, in a church that was divided then, in a church that might be divided now. I think he's calling us to have this kind of love towards our Enemies, those we might really have disagreements with. What does this kind of like love look like in our political and social divide? What does it look like to not insist on our own way? What's it look like to keep no record of wrongs? How do we truly bear with one another? How can we extend patience and grace and understanding to one another? Even those we strongly disagree with. I asked myself this week, is it even possible? (laughs) Is this kind of love and unity even possible in our incredibly divided, conflicted world? And I had to come back to the answer, which is yes, or else Jesus wouldn't have said it. The Bible wouldn't have been so clear. The New Testament wouldn't have this common, uh, this common witness to love in the midst of conflict. So much of the New Testament was written to churches going through conflict. They were conflicted on all kinds of issues. And so over and over and over again in the, in the letters that people write to the church, they talk about love because they needed that kind of love if they were going to stay together. And so we, we get this witness over and over again. In Colossians chapter 3, Paul writes, As God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, again, you're loved by God, so that's going to enable you to do something here. He says, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. All of those things are part of love. Bear with each other and forgive one another, part of love. And if, you, and if any of you has a grievance against someone Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, over all this love, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Perfect unity only comes if we put on love. 
a love that is patient and kind and humble and gentle, filled with compassion and grace and forgiveness and understanding. In 1 John chapter 4, John writes, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to what? Love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. If we love one another, people will see God. If we love one another, God's love is made complete. People see what's going on. And what does love look like? Love looks like Jesus who came into this world to take on our sin, to forgive us, to extend grace to us. What the early church leaders, the reason they talk about love so much and unity so much is because they want to fulfill one of the final prayers of Jesus. In the Gospel of John, we have a section where we hear many prayers of Jesus that he made the nights before he was crucified. So as Jesus is knowing he's going to die, this is the stuff that's on his mind. This is the desire of his heart. And so in John 17, at verse, beginning at verse 20, it's, this is Jesus praying, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. He's praying for us because we're the ones who didn't see the message lived out in Jesus. We are believing through the people who have shared the message. So Jesus is praying for us here. I pray for all those who will believe in me through their message that all of them, all of us, may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. His prayer is that we would be one, knowing that the only way that that's going to happen is if we love one another. So many times in their letters to the churches, the authors the leaders were saying, look, you got to love one another. you got to love one another. Why? So that you can be united, so that you can be one body in Christ, so that you can, can, can be one and experience joy, but also share joy, and so that the world would see Christ in you and that they would know that God loves them and maybe be drawn into his kingdom Jesus wants the church to be one, but from the very beginning, we have not done a very good job at being one. The history of the church has been one of division. We've divided over theological issues, social issues, justice issues, economic issues. Some churches have divided over what color carpet should go in the sanctuary. Our lack of ability to work together our lack of a rugged determination to stay connected to one another, our inability to love one another makes the world question whether or not the church loves at all. I want to be clear one more time. What I love about Faith Church and what brings me incredible joy is that somehow we've been able to hang together despite our differences. We have a lot of different views on a lot of different issues. But we also have a way of loving one another with the love of Christ. A love that takes the time to listen and to understand different perspectives. We might disagree on things, but I truly believe that our love for each other is what the world sees and why people are seeking out Faith Church. Because they're seeing a different way, maybe a path of salvation in life. 
As the world grows increasingly divided, the challenge to every church and to this church is that we have to find ways to stay together and to love one another, even though we may disagree. One very specific way that Paul highlights um, loving one another to bring unity and to experience joy is to be willing to humble ourselves the way that Jesus did. Again, if we go back to Philippians chapter 2, there's a section, it's often known as the Christ hymn. It could have been some kind of hymn in the early church. We don't know exactly where it came from, but it's a beautiful description of Jesus And so Paul begins by saying, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used to his own advantage or held on to or grasped. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And then, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself again by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. That's how much God loves us. God did not say, well, I'm just going to stay God and hold on to anything. In fact, I'm going to leave my throne in heaven and I'm going to come in the person of Jesus. I'm going to humble myself and and allow myself to be limited in the body of a human being. I'm going to humble myself so that I can walk with them and love them. And then I'm going to do it all over again because I'm going to humble myself and be a servant and take on a cross. I'm going to take on their sin and, and die for them so that they can know the joy of eternal life. And Paul says that is the mindset we all have to have. The things that we think are right, that we want to hold on to, can we hold it loosely so that we can, we can come and experience relationship with one another? And in those relationships, are we willing to serve to the point of being willing to sacrifice, to lift someone else up? It's it's not easy. It's possible because the power of the Holy Spirit enables us to have the mindset of Jesus Christ. It's what love looks like. It looks like always being willing to put the well-being of others before our own, the concerns of others before our own. It's how Jesus lived. It's how he loved. Great example of that is, again, the night before Jesus was crucified, he was at the Passover meal. No one washed anyone's feet. It probably really smelled. Maybe Jesus is like, I just can't take the smell anymore, so I'm going to go wash everyone's feet. And so he bends down, and he takes the role of the lowest household servant, and he washes the feet of everyone there. But then he said this, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, you must also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciple, if you... Love one another. Three times in three sentences, Jesus says, love one another. I think he means for us to love one another in a way where we humble ourselves and serve and sacrifice and put the needs of others before our own and where we bear with one another and are patient with one another and come together and understand one another where we don't always get our own way, but we work for the unity of the church. Let me share with you a few specific ways that we might be able to to hold together in this love for one another, work for unity and experience joy. I'm going to go through them quite quickly, but um, you can find them on the next steps. We have printed a few more. They're in the lobby for you. You can find them online. But these are just some ways that we can um, go back to saying, how can, I, how can I really love one another? How can I work for unity? First one is this, remember our common identity in Jesus Christ. 
Remember our common identity in Jesus Christ. We are all sinners. We are all in need of God's grace. None of us can do this on our own. We need Jesus. If we can remember that, mostly it's remembering, I mean, it's easy to see the sin in others, right? Mostly it's remembering I'm a sinner just like everyone else is, and I stand in need of grace and mercy just like everyone else does. The more we can see each other in this common experience, the more we can extend grace and love those around us. Second one, remember that we need one another. Remember when Adam was alone, God said, it is not good for a man to be alone. We need one another. There's conflict. There's division. It's a struggle. If we can love one another and bear with one another through it, we will experience joy and the fullness of life. We need one another. None of us has all of the gifts for the church. You don't want me playing drums or bass or guitar or a keyboard. Most of the time, you don't want me singing. We need one another. You don't want me trying to build a building or figure out the wiring or run a computer. If everyone was the same, the world would be very dull. Thank God we're not the same in that there's that there are differences that enhance who we are, even if it brings conflict. The third is stay humble. Paul said, always place others before yourself. Always look to the interest of others. Always value others before yourself. Humility really is what helps us to reach out in love. Believe the best in others. You know, what often brings a lot of conflict is that we really believe that the other side is not right or good. We want to demonize the other side. That way we don't have to listen or engage them. That way we can work to destroy them and in the process we destroy ourselves. Can we really believe the best in one another? What often brings conflict in relationships, in the family, in the church, among friends, at work, is that we just don't believe the best in others. We start putting other motives in there. We think that they're trying to undermine things. We think that they really don't like us. And and all of that begins to destroy relationship. Can we believe the best in one another? Love believes all things. Can you believe all the best things in others. And then don't give up on people. Love bears with one another. So when conflict comes, we don't walk away. We learn how to walk together. We don't dismiss people. We listen to them. We engage with them. We bear with one another. Another one is don't gossip. The New Testament talks so much about gossip because gossip destroys relationship. It destroys the church. So instead of using our words to put others down or tear people down, can we use our tongues, our words, our language to build people up? To speak positively of people and situations. And then the last one is check your own motives. Too often when conflict comes into a situation or we're feeling like division is needed, it's because we feel like, well, we need our own way. If we, there's nothing wrong with having strong views and opinions, trusting in what we believe is the right thing. What's wrong is to say, well, I want this at all costs. How can we hold on to our our deeply held views and opinions, but in a way that allows for us to be in relationship with one another. If our motive is to win at all costs and to make everyone think the way that I do, we will experience conflict. If we can hold our views, but in a way that extends grace and understanding, in a way that loves one another, We are able to be the church that Jesus prayed about, which is a church that remains together. 
See, relationships bring joy. We know that. We know this too. Relationship brings conflict. But if we can love one another through our differences, if we can humble ourselves, if we can work to have the mind of Christ, not only will we experience joy, but we're going to offer the world a different a different way to live, a different way to be in relationship. We're going to offer the world a glimpse of what the kingdom of God is like. This is the way of salvation. This is how, as, as a people, we can experience joy. If we can truly love one another, no matter what our views are, no matter what conflict we may have, if we can truly love one another, we communicate to the world that we can love. And we can love because of God. And that God loves them. I invite you to just show the world how to live like Jesus. Just love one another. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we know that we live in a, in a very divided time. We know that there's a lot of conflict. We, we see a lot of division. And honestly, God, we also have our own strong beliefs. I give you thanks and praise that at Faith Church for many years, we've been able to hold together in love. I thank you that we can come together despite some of those differences, but because we love you and we are seeking to, to genuinely love one another and build relationship and experience joy as part of your body and to offer that light and that love and that joy to the world. God, I pray that you would help us to continue to love one another. God, remind us what it what it means to, to just be part of the church. Remind us of our common identity. Remind us that we need one another. God, help us in humility to believe the best in others and to not give up. Lord Jesus, you prayed for unity in the church. You still pray for unity in the church. May we be a church. May we be a community that truly loves one another and therefore can, can say to the world that we can love them and that you, Lord Jesus, love them. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, our God is a faithful God. Uh, all throughout the Old Testament, whenever, um, whenever God was introducing himself to somebody, he would say, I'm the God of your father, Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, um, and it was a reminder that of all the times that God had been faithful before. Um, and the truth of the matter is, whenever we follow God, we experience the best life uh, that he has for us. And, and in order to experience joy, like we're talking about in this series, uh, following God's way for us is the best way for us. Um, and so our job is to trust in God. Trust that um, unity with one another as fellow believers is one of the uh, important things we need to do in order to find joy. And so as we close today, we're going to just be reminded of um, God's faithfulness, God's goodness, um, God being who he said he has been and he always will be. So let's stand together and trust in the promises of God. God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant, faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven that you do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come. 
as we go from here, may you know the faithfulness and the love and the presence of our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that's with you, not only here and now, but forever. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. See you next week.